Good morning. And I should say afternoon. It's after 12. Uh, but that's okay. Because we know that God is good. And all the time. Yeah, that's right. So, before I start, I have a, just a little season of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing each individual here today. And thank you for giving me the sermon today that it may be one that would be enlightening to each of the hearers and even also to the speaker. May your spirit guide our thoughts and our minds. May you come and sup with us as we break open the word of God. May you give us what you have for us today, Lord, that we not go away from this place hungry. But may we have the bread of life that you so freely give. And may we, our faith, be strengthened as we partake. And I ask all of these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Okay, I have this clicker. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming today. I also want to especially thank the Dela Cruz family who's here. Thank you. And if you're a visitor here, I want to welcome you. And I also uh, am very glad that you were able to be with us today. Normally, we are going out the door to go potluck right now, but um, just going to have to bear with me. I didn't know all of this was planned. So the sermon is probably going to be about 20 minutes at least. At least. Okay. We're going to start. Inheriting eternal life. And as you read, 17 through 22, King James Version. So let's go back and re-read it. And when he had gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou, thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad, and that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Wow. Uh, it's about inheriting eternal life, so I kind of wanted to just go over the word inherit. I know most of us understand what that is, but I always like to go back to the dictionary to refresh my memory about what I think it is. So that's what I did. And inherit, to take or receive property, right title, etc., by succession or will as an heir. To receive as if by succession from a predecessor. To receive a genetic character by transmission or a hereditary factor. And the last one, to receive qualities, powers, duties, etc. as by inheritance. Now, I looked at that meaning and I said, well, I can put, qualify all those things for the kingdom of God. Because that's what we are going to be partakers of. An inheritance. But did you know there are qualifications for inheritance, it's not something that you just give to everybody. Uh, all of you have families, and I'm sure that when you die, I'm probably not the first person on your will and your list. 
you know, if you'd like to write me in, that's fine, but that's okay, I understand. You're probably going to give your stuff to your relatives, correct? All right, so we have to qualify. Now, the question I ask here, did the rich young man qualify as an heir? I don't hear anything. Yes. I'm going to say the yes, too. But wait a minute. If not, what disqualified him? Can anybody tell me what disqualified him as an heir? Well, since we're trying to get out of here in 20 minutes, I'm just going to run through it and tell you what disqualified him. <laughs> what disqualified him was himself. He disqualified him. And this is something we need to remember as we sit in the pew week to week, as we go through our business, is that we need to be careful that we don't disqualify ourselves. Because many people in the, that will not see the kingdom, that's exactly what they do. They disqualify themselves. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen to us. And this is why this sermon today, I think, is going to help us with that. There's Jesus. There's a rich girl. You know, it's kind of like a, I think it was a movie. But, uh, oh my goodness, I'm going to have a hard time reading it. You guys can read that? Sometimes when I get these colors going. That's Mark 10, 21. I don't have my glasses. Oh, 24, you're right. Huh? I do have my glasses here someplace. Let me find them. I apologize. I thought you're 21 too. Oh. Are my glasses back there, Zachary? Someone read it, please. <laughs> Go ahead and read it, Mike. Because, uh, you know what? Wait a minute. I apologize. Oh, my. Here we go. Okay. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him uh, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, follow me. And he was at the Saturday saying, and went away of grief, for he had great possessions. And the key there is take up thy cross and follow me. Take up thy cross and follow me. Was the rich, young rich ruler a good man? Was he? Was he? Well, we say yes, he was, but one thing thou lackest, one. He only lacked one thing. Now, I can't say I lack one thing. I don't know if you can say you lack one thing, but I can't say I lack one thing. So I asked the question again, was he good? Even when he came to Jesus, he called Jesus good. And Jesus said, why callest thou me good? We got to be careful with that word good. Because many of us use it in such a way that we really believe we are. We really believe that. I'm a good person. Remember that one lady, wasn't there? They were carrying away to jail. She said, I'm a good person. Yes, but it's today you're going to jail. So we got to be careful with the word good because that is one word that can get us in a lot of trouble. Here's what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 16, 24. And Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. A lot of this cross taking. And what is that? What's that guy doing? Now he's got a cross, doesn't he? Does sometimes your cross feel like that? Man, I'm getting this sermon ready. That's how it felt for me, man. It was really difficult to figure this out, but let me tell you something. Let's see if we go. I know there's some writing going to come up here. There we go. What do these verses mean when they say, take up the cross and follow me? What do they mean? 
that's very important to understand. So we're going to go right to the source. I know that uh, a lot of people don't like Mrs. using Mrs. White's writing for some reason in our church. I don't understand that. I really don't. We're always trying to find another version. When all you have to do is go to Mrs. White, she has just about every verse in the Bible and get some meaning from it. She's the spirit of prophecy. That's what it's called. And I am just dumbfounded when I see people say, oh, well, she this, they just do all this stuff. But without her and the spirit of prophecy, wouldn't you have a Seventh-day Adventist church? We wouldn't have one. It wouldn't even be here. It's kind of like cutting your nose, you know, that kind of thing. But anyway, we really need to be more sensitive to that because what she has to say, really, to me, is the lesser light to expand on the greater light, which is the Bible. And we must understand that we can get some expansion here. Okay. The young ruler represented a large class who would be excellent Christians if there was no cross for them to lift, no humiliation to bear for them to bear, no earthly advantage to resign, no sacrifice of property or feelings to make. Christ has entrusted to them the capital of talents and means, and he expects corresponding returns. That which we possess is not our own, but is to be employed in the serving him, uh, from whom we have received all we have. And that's from the Revere and Herald, March 21st, 1878. So all that we have, God has given us. So when I asked the question, was the rich young ruler good? One thing that he wasn't good is he was not a good steward. Why wasn't he a good steward? Well, oh, she said it right there. This man had money and he had wealth. People going to him would have said he's a very generous person probably. But he was not a good steward in the sense that he could not let go of his wealth and he identified himself with his money. His money was part of him. And that's why he could not let go of it. An invitation from the master of the universe to come and follow and he could not get past his wealth. Many of us, I know, don't have that problem. But maybe some of us do. I and mean, maybe it's not wealth, it could be some other thing. But let's move on. How are we to be heirs? Does the Bible tell us how we are to overcome, to, be, to qualify? Because if we're going to qualify, we better look at the Bible and see how we're going to do that. Because we don't want to end up like the rich young ruler. And yes, it does. Revelation 3.21. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down on my throne. And set, set on my father, sorry, sat down with my father on his throne. So here we see how we overcome. We have to overcome like who? How did Jesus overcome? We have to overcome like Jesus overcame. Somebody said, whose throne's higher, uh, Jesus's or God's? Anybody know? I shouldn't do this to his kind of a church. Actually, their thrones are even. Because he's sitting down with the Father. And it says that we're going to sit with him. Jesus says that we are going to sit with him when we are overcomers. So that means we have to overcome like he overcame. Now, that's a sobering thought when you think of what Jesus had to go through. But that is the qualification. We must overcome just as Jesus overcame. Those are pearls. It says, we are to seek for the pearl of great price, but not in worldly marks or worldly ways. The, prices, the price we are required to pay is not gold or silver, for this belongs to God. Abandon the idea that temporal or spiritual advantages will 
win you salvation. Now, it amazes me here. I can understand temporal, but I didn't understand spiritual. Spiritual advantages. What is a spiritual advantage? I'll tell you what a spiritual advantage is. A spiritual advantage is being born in a church. A spiritual advantage is having, a, having gone to our schools. A spiritual advantage is Bible study and understanding it all. It says here, abandon the idea that temporal or spiritual advantages will win you salvation. Abandon it. And then I underline this statement. It says, God calls for your willing obedience. He asks you to give, to give up your sin. Willing obedience, and we must give up our sin. To him that overcometh Christ declares, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I have overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. So, willing obedience, and we have to give something up. We have to give up. Well, I'm glad somebody said that because that's very important. We have to give up our sin. Yes. Otherwise, we don't qualify. We don't qualify. Here we go. I'm a good person in most ways, but I'm beginning to think that being a good person in most ways doesn't count for anything very much if you're a bad person in one way. Do you know that we have to be sinless to go into heaven? How is that possible? We are not going to be sitting up until the time we roll into the gates. It says we have to be sinless, perfect. How is that possible? And I had to think about that because I'm a sinner, right? Yes, I am. Saved by grace. Now that is the key. There's that pearl again. Christ's Object Lessons, page 118, paragraph 1. There are some who seem to always seeking for the heavenly pearl, but they do not make an entire surrender of their wrong habits. They do not die to self that Christ may live in them. Therefore, they do not find the precious pearl. They have not overcome unholy ambition and their love for the worldly attraction. They do not take up the cross and follow Christ in the path of self-denial and sacrifice. Almost, almost Christian, yet not fully Christian. They seem near the kingdom of heaven but they cannot enter there. Almost not wholly saved. Means not almost, but wholly lost. Now, that's a sobering statement to me. Because I, you know, you come to the point where you just say, well, who can be saved? But you can be saved, and I can be saved, there is power for us to be saved and for power for us to stop sinning. There is power for us. There is hope. But we have to take hold of it. And we have to know how to tap into the power. Most Christians do not understand how to get the power to overcome sin. We don't understand it because we haven't studied it and we haven't done our homework to know. Some of us we just play the game. But that's okay. God knows our hearts. He really does. John 4, 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Jesus says, we're going to do greater works than he did. How is that possible? Think about it. We're going to do greater works than what Jesus Christ did himself? All things are possible with God. Jesus had an edge. No way we can be like him here in this sinful fallen earth. Is that a true statement? Because I hear it all the time. Jesus had an edge on me. Is that true? Verily, verily, I say unto you, Christ continued that he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he do also. The Savior was deeply anxious for his disciples to understand for what purpose his divinity was united with humanity. He came to the world to display the glory of God that man might be uplifted by its restoring power. 
God was manifested in him that he might be manifested in them. And here is the statement for today. Jesus received no qualities or exercised no power that men may not, may not have through faith in him. His perfect humanity is that which we all his followers may possess if they will be in subjection to God as he was. God, Jesus did nothing that we can't do. You must remember that. He even says we're going to do things more than he did. We had the children's story. Look at that story on that young man. Who would ever thought that with arms and legs you could do what he did? Now, all of us here that I, that I know of, that I can see, have arms and legs. What are we doing with them? I'm talking to myself, too. Okay? I'm talking to me. I'm not trying to hit you on the head with anything. I'm hitting myself at the same time. What's, what are the, what's going on here? How many men are walking on the water? It's easy. Just go ahead. Shout it out when you get the answer. Shout it out, because I'm not moving on until you do. Okay, I hate the little, you guys want to leave, see? You, young, you adults like to stay. Huh? These little kids are saying, two, there's two men walking on the water. We forget that. We say Jesus walked on the water. We now hear a song about Peter walking on the water. He walked on the water. He's doing what Jesus did. He raised the dead. He did what Jesus did. This illustrates that our condition had, is no excuse for sin. We have no excuse for sin because we have the power if we will only grab hold and submit ourselves to it. Christ's Objects Lesson, page 333, paragraph 1. As the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. What does that word omnipotent mean? Anybody know? You guys know. I know you know. You just don't want to say. What does it mean? All powerful. And it says here that as the will of man cooperates, that's the key word, with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. Whatsoever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength. All his biddings are enabling. You guys didn't know that you had a will that was omnipotent with the power with God's when you cooperate with God. Did you know that? You might know it, but do you believe it? Do you believe it? Because knowing is not enough. You must believe it. If you don't believe it, you can you may just walk, you know, you're just walking around knowing all kind of stuff, but you don't believe. It's omnipotent. So is there something in your life today that you want to give up? Is there something that you want to get past? Is there somebody that you need to help or something you need to do? I don't know. I'm just throwing this out here. But your will, if you cooperate with God, becomes omnipotent. And you have the power when you cooperate to make that thing happen. I hard calling. The obedience of Christ to his Father was the same obedience that is required of man. Man cannot overcome Satan's temptations without divine power to, to combine with his instrumentality. So with Jesus Christ, he could uh, lay hold of divine power. He came not to our world to give uh, the obedience of a lesser God to a greater but as a man to obey God's holy law. And in this way, he is our example.
Jesus came as a man. People give Jesus uh, too much credit. They think that, I shouldn't say that, but maybe I'm not giving him enough credit as being a man. We look at him as being a God. Yes. But he came as a man like you and me. Jesus could have failed in his mission. There was a real, how can I say this? There was a real risk. He didn't fail, but he could have. That is something that we don't think about. You think we, he did it? Yes, he obeyed his father and he was able to get through it, but he could have failed. The Lord Jesus came to our world not to reveal what God could do, but what man could do through faith in God's power to help in every emergency. Man is through faith to be partakers of the divine nature and to overcome every temptation wherewith he is beset. Our high calling page, uh, uh, is that 48, paragraph 3, is that 46? 48, paragraph 3. So he didn't come to show how God was going to do this. He came to show how you're going to do this. He's our example that way. Okay? Is that the world? Yes, it is. It's a flat world. But it's a world. Anyway, I've got to get better colors. I'm just a poor choice when I do these things. Maybe I can read it better back this way. God so loved the world, but there are some things that even an almighty God cannot do. Can you believe that? There are some things that God can't do. This guy, say I'm up here teaching blasphemy. Go ahead, say that. Because that's not, not true. I'm up here to give you the truth. There are some things that God cannot do. And I can only find two. God cannot lie. He can't lie. And this is what says it. Titus 1-2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So he can't lie. God can't lie. God cannot force your will to stop you from sinning. He cannot force your will. He can try to help you with it, but he can't force your will. If he does that, if he does either of these two things, he stops becoming God. He can't do that. Ezekiel 33, 11 Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his ways and live. Turn ye, turn ye, turn from your evil ways, for my, for why will you die, O house of Israel? You will die because you did not turn. That is the only reason that anybody on earth dies because we don't turn from our evil ways and we think we're good. Because there's going to be a lot of people crying, Lord, 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 I'm a good person. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Never knew you. He didn't say I kind of knew you. He said, I never knew you. Because you didn't take time to know him. Okay, one to, whoop, too far. I go back. Okay, that we're almost done. I took longer than 20 minutes. I apologize. <laughs> In summary, how are we to hear or internal life? Maybe this last quote says it all. And I don't want to leave you guys without power. You know how you stop sinning? how you get over something. Maybe you drink. Maybe you smoke. Maybe you're looking at things you shouldn't look at. Maybe you're doing things that you shouldn't. The power is in His Word. 
I don't know what it is that besets you. But whatever it is, I don't care if it's lying, cheating, whatever it is. You go to His Word and you claim the promise. The power is in the Word. And when you claim that, maybe you can If you're a drunkard, you don't go down and say, uh, well, Lord, help me not drink for a month. Well, that might be a little bit too much. Maybe you can try it for a day. Or maybe you have to go down and say, I won't do it for this hour. But whatever it is that besets you, it's here. Power is here in His Word for you. I don't know what it is. For the rich young ruler, it was greed. And we have to be specific about what we, what we know too. Because a lot of times, we're not specific enough about what's besetting us. And the Holy Spirit cannot work in us unless we confess that sin to it and allow that uh, to be taken away. So let's go ahead. I'm, I apologize. I get off on my track here. Testimonies to the church. Volume 4. God cannot save man against his will from the power of Satan's artifices. Man must work with his, with his human power, aided by the divine power of Christ, to resist and to conquer any, at any cost to himself. In short, man must overcome as Christ overcame. This is not an easy thing to be a Christian. If you're going to be a Christian, it is tough. But remember, the man who went before you, he'd hang on a cross. He got nails in his hands. He was crucified, sped upon, and he did that for your example. And then through the victory that is, is, it is in his privilege to gain by all the powerful name of Jesus, he may become an heir of God and joint heir with Jesus Christ. This could not be the case if Christ alone did all the overcoming. Man must do his part. He must be victor on his own account through the strength and grace that Christ gives him. Remember that. It's not, you're not alone in this. Through the strength and grace that Christ gives him. Gives him. Man must be a co-worker with Christ in the, in the labor of overcoming, and then he will be partaker with Christ in his glory. God has a place for us. All of us. He wants all of us there. And all he wants you to do is surrender. Surrender your will to him so that he can make a new person and that you might and I might be partakers with him in his glory. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Okay. Now that we know that it's wonderful, now we got the hard work to do. It's time to roll up your sleeves. Because now we have work.